Hello, everyone. Thank you so much, Miranda, for inviting me. Uh, it's a pleasure for me to be here today with all of you guys. My name is Moira. Um, I'm a veterinarian and a dog behavior consultant. I am originally from Chile, but I have been living in the U.S. for around four years. I'm actually right now in Brazil, not in the U.S., but not in Chile. Uh, I am stuck here due to testing uh, positive to COVID, so I hope the uh, internet connection is good enough and that we don't have any glitches. Um, and as I was introducing myself, uh, besides being a veterinarian, I'm also a certified separation anxiety trainer. I have been working as a behavior consultant for uh, around... If, 13 years or so. And uh, during the last four years, I have been exclusively focusing on separation anxiety cases. And since technology is our best friend nowadays, I've been able to help people all around the world, both in English and Spanish. So before I get started, I'm going to share my screen with you. And as I do that, I would love to know who of you are dog guardians. So not dog pros, just dog guardians that are interested in learning more about separation anxiety. If you can type it down in the chat box and at the same time, maybe telling me where are you from? Because since it's this is online, maybe you are not from Austin, maybe you are from somewhere else. So I would love to know uh, where you are located. And here's my screen. I'm going to open a chat box so I can read what you are right someone's gonna have to be brave there we go there we, we go started <laughs> we got a dog sitter and dog walker. sitter dog mom dog guardian different places love it From san francisco colombia all right dog mom colombia wow colombia that's so great dog mom south carolina animal rescue Perfect. And how many dog pros um, are here? I would love to know. Sydney. Oh my goodness. <laughs> so Sonia's in here. I think we've got a few dog pros in here. Perfect. Awesome. So we will get started. And uh, the big subject of today, the one we chose with Miranda was, is it really separation anxiety? We know that since COVID started, dogs have had big changes also besides the changes we have gone through right and they have been uh, with us for a long time more so in the locations where we had lockdown or many of us adopted dogs uh, during COVID and now we are transitioning to our normal back to our normal lives right and so this separation anxiety term anxiety term has become widespread and there is a lot of people who are afraid that their dog might be suffering from separation anxiety and so what I want to share with you today is a little bit of information about separation anxiety and all the other things that also a dog could be suffering from that could be similar or could look like separation anxiety but without being it and so we will get started here when you hear the word separation anxiety, the term separation anxiety, what do you think? What common signs do you think? What, what do you think the dog is doing when left alone? Typical things are probably my dog is eliminating while alone. So my dog is defecating or urinating in the house while I'm not there. Another typical sign that we could think of is vocalizations. My dog barks all day, my dog cries, howls, whines, etc. And also, it could be that our dog is destroying things. My dog chews on everything, doors, remote controls, my shoes, the, tries to escape the crate, et cetera, right? So all of those things are typical of a dog who has some sort of issue being left alone. But is that separation anxiety necessarily? There is something that we have to learn before we dive deep into separation anxiety. And that is a term called separation-related behaviors. What are separation-related behaviors? Are all the behaviors that a dog can do while alone that are undesirable for us and or for them. Okay, so that includes all the ones that we described a moment ago, vocalizing, eliminating, destroying on objects and many other things. Anything that we wouldn't like our dogs to do and that it may be that it represents that our dog is not having a good time. 
However, this separation related behaviors can happen for several reasons. And we will list a few of those potential reasons why a dog could be doing these things. One of them could be confinement issues. What does that mean? Confinement issues means that a dog doesn't do well when confined in a restricted area. And so for that particular dog, being confined in restricted is aversive, but not necessarily being left alone. It's just that they don't handle well being confined. And confinement is sort of a Real, relative uh, term, why? And it, it, it depends on the perspective, perspective of who is looking and why, because I have had cases where people tell me, well, but my dog has a lot of room. I have a big living room and my dog stays there while alone and I have a baby gate, but my dog reacts anyway. So it shouldn't be confinement issues what my dog is suffering from. But the truth is that maybe I think that the living room is big enough, but maybe from the perspective of my dog, that is a very restricted space. And so what happens with dogs who suffer from confinement issues is that anything that makes them feel that they don't have room enough to move around the house, control over the resources, the space, they will react. And they will also react when alone in that confined, in that confined space. And so it will look like separation anxiety. However, if you put that dog free in the house and then you leave him alone, it, and, and if the dog doesn't suffer from, separ from separation anxiety and only from confinement issues, that dog will not react. One little thing that usually helps a lot is dogs having physical access to the door the guardian left from. And so if they can actually touch the door and if they don't suffer from separation anxiety, they tend to feel, feel more comfortable about being left in that space. Some dogs have learned to be okay in confinement when someone is around. So a lot of people tells me, well, tell me, uh, well, but my dog is okay sleeping in the crate at night, but then when I leave my dog alone in the crate, my dog reacts. So it must be separation anxiety. Well, but sometimes what happens is that that dog learns to handle the situation while someone is around, but when they're left alone in that setup, it's just too much to take. However, we have to consider that there's a high correlation between confinement issues and separation anxiety. So it could also be that we're seeing both. And that's what we're gonna be talking about a little bit later down the road about how to assess this and how to rule out if it's one or the other or both. So we can set up and implement the best training program to help them overcome these issues. But that's one important thing to consider. It could be confinement, and not necessarily separation anxiety, what your dog is experiencing. Another cause of separation related behaviors could be health issues. And that is a big one. And it's unfortunately one that is very underrated and that we tend to pass and not really pay attention to when we are thinking that our dog is struggling with some behavior uh, issue or a behavior uh, uh, a behavior problem. And what happens is that if you see your dog experiencing something, a change in his behavior acutely, it could be that that behavior is just not, it's not only behavioral, it's due to something else going on, physically speaking, medically speaking. Yeah. And so it is very important to first rule that out with your bed. Examples of this, and this is not super health, but it's not super health related, but so, somewhat it is. Um, I had this uh, client once, um, it actually wasn't my client, it was the client of a colleague, but she contacted me because this dog had been okay all his life. And all of a sudden he was growing older and all of a sudden he started reacting and barking one alone, but after five hours of being left alone. So the dog was totally fine. And after five hours, he would start, start vocalizing until someone would come back. And they weren't sure what was going on. We rule out confinement, separation anxiety. And I just wasn't sure if this was separation anxiety due to the nature of the signs and how they were displayed. So, so later down the road during the absence. And what happened was that finally, after a thorough diagnosis, we realized that the issue was that the dog couldn't hold it for so long anymore and really needed to go potty. 
And so he was starting to vocalize after five hours because he needed to go to the bathroom. And once they started taking the dog out for a walk in the middle of the day and separate and split the absence in two, the dog stopped vocalizing and the problem was solved. And so it is important to consider those aspects before jumping right away into, oh, my dog is probably suffering from separation anxiety because he's reacting when alone. A lot of other variety of health issues could also be uh, causing or triggering these behaviors, such as suffering from any sort of pain that are making, making them more irritated, uh, anything that could be uncomfortable, including, of course, health issues that could be changing behavior, something that is hormonal, that could be affecting behavior directly, but anything could do. So that's why it's so important to have a thorough health exam before jumping into any conclusions. And that is something that I always suggest to all of my clients when I run the first uh, initial assessment. Another thing that could be causing separation-related behaviors is the environment. And so depending on where you live, it could be that, let's say you live in a very crowded, busy area, and out of your window, you can see people passing by, kids, uh, dogs walking by, and it could be that your dog is barking because he's seeing all of those things, but he is barking to those specific things. And once those things are gone, your dog is able to relax. So it might be that your neighbor tells you, you know what, your dog has been barking all day. And you can jump into a conclusion right away and say, oh, you know what, my dog should, it's probably suffering from separation anxiety because my neighbor told me that he has been barking all day. But truly the barking wasn't due to anxiety or being uh, stressed about being alone. It was just due to those specific situations that your neighbor can't really tell the difference, right? And so it is important to consider that anything in the environment could be leading to these symptoms or signs. Also, for example, uh, if your the space is too small and your dog has high energy, for example, it could be that that's why your dog is maybe destroying on objects while he's alone and it's environmental and it's not because your dog is in distress, distress due to being left alone, I mean. It could be that your dog needs to go to the bathroom as we had been talking before and there is no space provided for that purpose when he's alone. So that would be environmental too. And so your dog is making mistakes or going into in, in places that are undesirable for you, but it is only due to the environment not being the right one for that particular dog. Another cause of this separation related behaviors, and I'm moving the cameras here so I can see, is excess of energy. And we already talked a little bit about that, right? So if I have a dog who is high energy and I am not providing the enough exercise to that dog, for example, or I am you know, not giving my dog walks or different activities and I leave my house for eight hours at, the, at a time, it might be that my dog is destroying objects, barking, just out of being bored and because I am not fulfilling his needs. And so it is also, again, important to consider those aspects before jumping into conclusions. Oops. One second here, there you go. Another reason could be lack of education. And with lack of education, I mean, just that the dog hasn't learned what are our rules or what are the things that we desire or not in, in terms of what things they are allowed to do or not in the house. So we haven't communicated with them uh, appropriately so they know that the pillow isn't a toy um, or that they can't go to the bathroom in a certain place. And so they're doing those things while alone because there's nobody there to supervise them or to give them the chance to do something else or to teach them to go to a better, to a place that is more desirable for us. And so it will look like separation anxiety. It will look like when I come back home, there is destruction, there is pee, there's poop there. And I might think that it's separation anxiety, but it's not necessarily that, right? And so here, there are a few examples before we jump into the separation side. It is the last one, the last uh, cause that could be leading to these behaviors. 
I have a few examples here, a few videos that I want to share with you. So this video is about confinement issues instead of separation anxiety. And unfortunately, I don't have the before part of this video. So I don't have the dog reacting well in the crate, but I can tell you a little bit about the background information of this dog. So you can put this in context when you watch it. So this was a dog. Um, she was, I believe uh, it was eight years old or so, and she had been adopted, I think, three years ago. She was a therapy dog. She was great in every way. And, but she used to react when alone. And she had always been left alone in a crate because when they adopted her, they put her in a crate, she reacted, they seek for help. And the suggestion to handle the separation anxiety was to put her in a crate and continue leaving her in a crate. This dog had lost, I think it was I, I, I might be wrong uh, in the exact number, but I think it was seven teeth trying to escape the crate and they didn't know what else to do at this point. And when I asked, the only time that they had assessed the dog or left the dog in another setup that was in the crate had been in a room with the door closed. I think it was like an office room with the door closed and the dog had reacted in the same way or pretty similar. So they had fog that they had already ruled out free in the house. And that for them, the conclusion was that the dog would react in every single environment. And so we done an assessment with the dog free in the house. And what you're gonna watch right now is what we watched. We will discuss this after you watch the video. So as you can see, there's not much action there, right? Um, you can see that the dog wanders around and sort of evaluates the situation and she ends up laying down with the head down. This was our first attempt to do a, an assessment free in the house. It was the first time we had met. And if you paid attention to the subtleties during the video, you, you may have, um, seen that the dog did pant a little bit, licked her lips, and was a little bit unsure about what to do and what was happening. And that is fairly normal because this was the first time that she was actually exposed to the situation. So she wasn't, and it's very common to see, she wasn't really sure to, what to expect, what to do. But then once she found herself free and uh, not in confinement anymore, she was able to handle the situation and relax. We did follow up a month from then, and everything had gone amazing. And after that first time, after that first time free in the house, they never left her in the crate again, and she never reacted ever again. That is a classical example of a dog who suffers from confinement issues, but not separation anxiety. And so when you release the confinement, the dog sometimes decides what to do, maybe is a little bit unsure, but then you see that over time the dog relaxes and is able to act completely normal and settle while alone. And so that is one of the things that is very important to rule out if you think your dog might be suffering from separation anxiety, but you have never left him free in the house. Because this is much easier and faster to solve that than if your dog is actually suffering from separation anxiety, because you just focus on leaving your dog with free access. And of course, creating an environment that is uh, safe for the dog and making sure that your dog is reliable and knows what are your rules, your house rules. So there's no issues in that regard. Another example of separation related behaviors without being separation anxiety is adapting to being left alone. 
And this is a big one now due to the pandemic, because as we were talking before, many dogs during the pandemic ne were never left alone. Some of them were dogs that had lived in the same house prior to the pandemic and they were okay being left alone, but then they went through this big shift of never being alo alone again. And then they started transitioning into being alone again when things came back to normal or somewhat normal. And there were other dogs though that were adopted and never left alone. And suddenly after six months or a year or three months, they needed to start learning how to be left alone. And so this, what you're gonna see now is what this typically look like. You see a dog who is left alone for the first time and isn't completely sure that this is okay. So the dog might react a little bit uh, in an overt way and in, in a way that uh, suggests that he's in distress and he, the dog might vocalize, the dog might pace around a little bit, but you will see that with the passing of the minutes, the dog is able to cope with the situation, handle it, and finally settle and relax, which is something that a dog with separation anxiety isn't able to do. And we will talk more about that in a minute. And so if you see that curve with your dog, and when I'm talking about settling, it's not in a tense way and moving around a second after they settle, it's actually settling and relaxing, laying down, head down, or, or in that direction, going into that direction throughout the absence. And if you are unsure the first time you do an absence and you watch your dog and you see somewhat something similar to what I just described, but not quite, what you will be paying attention to and what you will want to do is to repeat absences every day and you will expect to see that this gets better and better and better over time. And so your dog settles faster and faster and reacts less and less intense over time. If it goes in the other direction, it means that probably it, it could be separation anxiety, what we are facing. And so this dog was a dog it, was, it wasn't a dog um, that we worked uh, on together during the pandemic. It was actually a dog that I worked with prior to the pandemic, but it was a similar situation. The dog had been adopted uh, from Puerto Rico and they had only left the dog alone in confinement. And in just a few occasions, the dog had also confinement issues. Um, and so the dog had never had the chance to really adapt to being left alone. And so just pay attention to... Um, the subtle piece of the dog's body language, because that's gonna be really helpful for the videos that you're gonna watch later on during this webinar. And we will discuss it after we watch the video. The background noise is just uh, birds. It was uh, summertime and uh, the windows were open. So uh, it's not him, but if if you paid attention, you probably were able to hear a little bit of a whining. So the dog did whine a couple of times and I don't know if you noticed, but there was some lip, uh, lip licking and he was definitely looking at the door, sniffing the air and trying to figure out what was going on. But after a while, he was able to finally cope with it and handle it and settle down until the guardian came back. That is very typical of a dog who is adapting to the situation because the difference between that particular dog and a dog with separation anxiety is that that dog has the tools or knows how to use the tools and coping mechanisms 
to handle an absence. A dog with separation anxiety doesn't know how to use those tools. And that's what we teach them throughout a training program to overcome this disorder. And so since we're already talking about that, one other reason for a dog to show separation related behaviors while alone is of course separation anxiety. And about separation anxiety, how do we find out that a dog actually suffers from it and not from all of the other things that we just mentioned? There are two main aspects of the assessment to find out that if this is going on or not. The first part is gathering all the background information. And if you're not a dog pro, that's fine. Because what I mean with this is that you want to consider everything in the life of the dog to have a clear idea of what might be going on. And so examples of this, ex practical examples of this could be, where do you live? Is it a busy area? Do, does your dog usually bark at things while you're in the house? If he sees the mailman coming or dogs passing by, um, is your dog a puppy? Is your dog old? Does your dog have any health issues? Uh, it has been a long time since you took your dog to the vet for the last time and you don't know what might be going on. Um, is your dog a high energy dog? Does your dog have other behavior struggles? For example, is your dog noise sensitive and you live in an area where there's thunderstorms uh, and in, during that season is when your dog is reacting the most? Uh, is your dog reactive to certain situations in the environment that could be happening in your environment where you live? All of those things are really gonna help you to understand better what could be going on changes? Have you experienced changes in the environment lately? Um, did you move? Um, did you move from, from uh, you know, to a, in a city to another? Did someone in, did the, 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 uh, the members of the house change in your house? Anything that could potentially be traumatizing for the dog? Did you lose another dog that your dog was leaving, living with? Any of those things could potentially be either a trigger to separation anxiety or just explain better what is happening in this specific situation. So make a list of every single thing that is happening in your environment and to your dog so you have a better idea of this. And after you do that, you will want to run an alone time assessment. And an alone time assessment means that you will watch your dog while he is left alone and you are gone from the area. You wanna stay close because you wanna come back soon and you don't want to keep this absence too long. It's just a trial, it's just an assessment, but you want to make sure your dog thinks that you're gone. Because if you're outside the door, it could be that your dog is reacting, but not due to separation anxiety, but perhaps due to frustration because he knows you're on the other side, but he can reach you. FOMO or fear of missing out is a big thing and it's a real thing. And so we want to make sure that we are also ruling that out. Now, a couple of things that we have to learn about the alone time assessment, and you will it, it will look super clear because I'm gonna show you a lot of videos about how to do that. But the first thing I wanted to mention was what can you use to run this assessment? And there are a variety of ways that you can do this. From platforms, which we all, I don't know if unfortunately or fortunately learn how to use, maybe this is the, the pro or the good side effect of the pandemic, but platforms, online platforms that you can connect to, such as Zoom, you're using it right now, Skype, FaceTime. There's an app that calls many things that works uh, with between mobile devices. So if you have a tablet and a phone, for example, or two phones, you can connect those two. And what you do with these platforms is basically you connect a device that you will leave at home it could be a computer, a tablet, another phone, and you point it towards ideally the area where you left from, because if your dog suffers from separation anxiety, that that's where the dog is likely going to stay most of the time. If your dog goes to your room and disappears and is in complete silence, and your room is far from the, the, the door where you left from, you will assume that things are probably going well, and your dog is relaxed. And so you will point that computer or device towards that area, and you will connect that device through Zoom or Skype or FaceTime or many things with your phone. So you can observe your dog while you're outside. And remember to mute yourself so your dog can't hear you. 
and you will watch live while you are out. This, when you watch live, it's much easier to be proactive about it because if you're watching that your dog is in distress and things are not going well and they don't look good and they don't look like he is going to be able to settle, you can just cut it short and come back as soon as you have seen enough. Uh, but if you are watching a recording or if you are not seeing what's happening live, you will have to stay for a little bit longer so you can like make sure that you have a better idea of what's happening afterwards when you watch the recording in case your dog didn't do anything or didn't show any signs of distress. But I am, I am going ahead. We will talk about that in a second. Another option are cameras. And if any of you are struggling with a dog that might be suffering from separation anxiety, you're likely to already have a camera because cameras nowadays are pretty inexpensive. There are many options out there. And many of us also have cameras just because we have surveillance cameras in, your, in our houses. But these are just a few ideas of things that could work. There are doggy cameras, the official doggy cameras, such as Forbo, for example, which can work. It's, it's great. But you don't actually need something super fancy. Just any surveillance camera will do. You just want to be able to watch your dog from your phone. And all of these cameras work in a very similar, in a very similar way. You basically download an app in your phone, it connects with the camera, and then you just are able to you know, walk around and leave and observe your dog through your phone. Some of them have different features. My favorite is WISE. WISE, it's pretty inexpensive and they have different types. They have one type that is panoramic, so you can actually move it, move it from your phone which is a great benefit because if you have a house that has a lot of little edges and corners, if you have a camera that you can move, it will allow you to see a wider range in your house. Uh, another feature that WISE has, you can record, you can zoom in. And so if your dog is very far, you will be able to observe your dog. And you can also have a gallery view with all the cameras working at once and with the audio included, which is very, uh, very uh, beneficial if you have a house with many different rooms and you want to be able to observe different rooms if your dog moves around. So um, that's one of the ones I use the most, but any camera again will do. And what you want to see is again, you want to leave the area and observe your dog through your phone and observe what he is doing. And finally, if you feel like you don't want to invest in any of this, or if you actually aren't sure if your dog suffers from separation anxiety and you just want to kind of make sure and rule out, but it's not a big suspicion and a big concern of you, of yours, then maybe just recording your dog and just ruling that out and feeling at peace with it would, would be a good idea. And if then you see something that is concerning, then you can go and invest in something fancier. And ways of recording, many. You could have a, a computer that allows you to record. You could just leave your phone in the house recording. Like if you were just recording a video on your phone, you could have a GoPro or any other camera that allows you to record. Again, if you record, you won't be seeing things live. So you will have to just set a timeline and you will have to, uh, let's say, go out, leave the area and come back 15 minutes later and watch the recording. And if you haven't watched enough and you are not sure of what would happen, you will have to probably repeat it on another day and go a little bit farther, maybe do a 30 minute one so you can see everything and make sure that your assessment was uh, spot on. Now, why do we want to go into all this hassle of getting a camera or recording and observe our dog to run this on long time assessment? And why can't we just listen to what our neighbor told us when he said that our dog was barking the whole time? Um, or why can't we just send a picture of the destruction our dog did to our trainers so they can conclude what's going on? Well, the reason why is because as we said before, there are many reasons why our dog could be displaying the signs, right? The separation related behaviors. And so a dog could be barking, but that doesn't mean that our dog is in distress. Our dog could be barking because he has a lot of energy in his board. It could be the dog could be barking because there's something outside or the dog could be barking because he's in distress. And the only way that we will be able to tell the difference is by observing our dog's body language. That is what's going to tell us what's going on. Plus a few other things that we will talk about 
in a little bit uh, in the next video. So what I want you to pay attention to in this video is the differences between different dogs who are performing exactly the same behavior, but with a totally different body language. Let's see. And it's gonna be loud. Sorry about that. It looks pretty different, right? The barking is very different. The body language that the dog, the dogs uh, show when they are doing these behaviors is it's it's easy to see, right? It's easy to see the difference between one and the other. Um, you see that one dog, the, the dog, the white one, are just barked one time, and when the situation was gone, he was able to settle back down. The other dog was a, a whole different story, right? And so that's one of the things that we want to keep in mind. Another one is that there are a few other things that dogs with separation anxiety have in common that we will be able to see when we run this alone time assessment. And so we talk about this common science, right? And the truth is that besides this science being able to happen in dogs who don't suffer from separation anxiety, there's not really a rule for dogs with separation anxiety in terms of what signs they display. So with that, with what I mean with this is that they don't have to follow a certain amount of signs or a certain combination to suffer from separation anxiety. So it's not that the separation anxiety dog <clears throat> barks, destroys, and eliminates. Some dogs bark, some dogs eliminate, some dogs destroy, some dogs do combinations of those. Some dogs only hypersalivate. And so there is, since there's no rule, it's very hard to just focus on that to be able to run a full assessment and to conclude if a dog suffers from this or not. And that's why we have to pay attention to a few other things. And we will discuss um, them and I'll summarize them after we watch this video, but you will be able to see them throughout the passing of this video um, where Gal, a little dash um, was featured. Let's watch and we will discuss it later. And the sound starts a little bit later, so it's it's fine. There is. Sound. So summarizing, things that dogs with separation anxiety have in common. The first one, we already talked about it before, body language. The body language that they will display while they're doing this science will suggest that they are in distress, that they're not having a good time. The second one is that since separation anxiety is aversive, it means that they are, they, they, being left alone is aversive to them. What's gonna happen? is that when they're exposed to being left alone, they will really, really, really try to deal with it. They will try to cope with the situation, but they will reach a point 
where they can't handle it anymore, a point during that absence. If that can be seconds, it can be minutes. And at that point, the situation will become aversive to them. That point we call threshold. And that threshold is um, represented by the first overt sign of distress. So the first barking, the first destroying of objects, the first elimination, the first panting. From that point on, from that point where the situation becomes aversive, they won't be able to relax or settle until that stimulus, that situation is removed. In other words, until they are not alone anymore and until someone is back. Instead, the signs will escalate in intensity over time or they will be cyclical. And if you're gone for eight hours, your dog will react for the eight hours. Might react and stop, react and stop, but won't ever fully settle because he can't because the situation is aversive to him. And the third main thing that they have in common is that this threshold we were talking about will usually be fairly soon and within the first 30 minutes of absence if you haven't worked with your dog for him to be comfortable with more than 30 minutes alone. And so those are the typical things that we observe in the alone time assessment. We pay attention to where the threshold, when the threshold happens after the person leaves the house, after the person closes the door. And after that threshold, which is again, the first time that the dog does something overt, we observe if the dog is able to relax or not, or if the signs increase in intensity. That if the dog doesn't react in 30 minutes, we assume that there's probably not separation anxiety and the dog is reacting due to something else later on during the absence. Now, what, now that we know what things to look for during an assessment, if we find out that the dog actually reacts, goes over threshold and isn't able to settle and we decide and conclude that the dog suffers from separation anxiety, what do we do? <laughs> and that's when we go into what is separation anxiety fairly quick, and we will go, go through what to do about it and how to implement a successful program to help. Separation anxiety, as I mentioned before, is the panic of being left alone. For that dog who suffers from this disorder, being left alone is an aversive stimulus. That means that even though he will try to cope with the situation, will reach a point where it's not possible for him. And the signs that they will display will be involuntary because they go through physiological changes due to being in survival mode and fight or flight mode. And those physiological changes lead to consequences that are all the, the signs, the overt signs that we see that are just an expression of that underlying fear and anxiety that the dog is experiencing at that time. This is fairly easy to understand, but sometimes we have a very hard time relating to it. And that's why I love to give examples and analogies of how we might feel in situations such as that. So what I would like you to do is a little bit of a little exercise. I would like you to think about something you really dislike, something that is physical, not something you don't like a little bit, something that really affects you and that you can't control. And we humans have a lot of those, right? Some like there's, it's very typical to dislike snakes and rats and spiders and heights and dark spaces, crowded spaces, etc. I'll share mine with you just to empathize with the situation. I'm afraid of moths and you will see it in a moment in a video I'm gonna show you. And even though I know that moths are completely harmless and I know it's ridiculous, I just can't. And it's something physical. When I am exposed to a moth, I go through physiological changes. My breathing changes, my heart rate changes. I start sweating, my pupils dilate, and I prepare for an emergency. And what I do next, it's just involuntary. And it's just an expression of what I am experiencing or feeling at the time. And so different alter egos of me could experience different things. Some one, one version of me could just run away and hide. Another could freeze and cry. Another one could just start banging things and then throwing things at them all. But there is not really a rule for what to do because again, these are just expressions of what's going on through my own body. And I can't really stop myself from doing them. And so when you work with a dog with separation anxiety, if you focus on the signs, 
you won't really solve the main issue, which is this fear and panic of being left alone, which is a maladaptive behavior. The dog isn't in control over the situation, even though it sounds funny, like my moths, it sounds silly that I'm afraid of them. It sounds silly that a dog doesn't learn over time that being alone is fine because they can't, because they're experiencing this panic. And that's why we have to teach them to learn how to cope and learn how to use tools to cope with this situation so they can overcome this fear and therefore overcome separation. Now, once we know that a dog suffers from separation anxiety, we will implement a training program, right? And in order to do so, my first big question for you guys is, does severity matter? Should I pay attention to how severe the signs are? How intense the signs? Should I maybe say, oh, you know what? But this is sort of a mild separation anxiety because my dog only whines when alone. He doesn't hurt himself. So I'm just gonna not really focus on it. It's not a priority because probably will pass over time. Or maybe I should say, oh, you know what? This dog is harming himself. So this is very dangerous and I should do something right away because this is very severe. I just want you to think about this, this, just the statements that I just made and watch this video and then we will talk about it. Hey, Mara, just a quick heads up. Sound isn't coming through with the videos. So if there's anything that you want us to hear, you may need to let Excuse us know. Me. Uh, excuse me, what do you say? I was very loud. So oh, sorry. The, video. the the sound isn't coming through on the videos for us. So if there's anything that we need uh, to hear, if you'll just tell us what's happening, it's not coming through. Oh, okay. And the other videos that uh, we watch, you, you can't hear anything either? Correct. Yeah. Oh, I'm so sorry about that. Okay. So I'll, is there a way that we can, let me do this because I think I know, I know what's the, what's the problem. So let me try to fix this. And in the meantime, there you go. This was the issue. Okay, I think, let me know if you can hear this, please. Yep, we can hear this one. Okay. Yay. So just, uh, yay. So just a little bit of a recap, because I'm sorry you didn't watch the, you weren't able to, to hear the other ones, but, um, I don't know, maybe we should play them. I don't know what you think, Miranda, but the ones, the videos with the dogs barking and uh, scratching and the dachshund that was barking, uh, I'm assuming that you were able to see the mouth barking and you were assuming that the dogs were barking, but let me know if you want to rewatch those because it's important uh, and, and I don't know if it would be beneficial. Yeah, let's let's do that because I know there were a couple of folks saying that they couldn't hear, so okay. um, that would be awesome if you have time. Yes. So let's go back to that before we watch this one. And don't forget about what I was explaining. <laughs> so we'll come back to it. So I think um, these are the two most important ones. The other ones didn't really have audio. So this is loud. <laughs> just, just beware. <laughs> Okay, so now I feel silly that I was like talking about all the parking and nobody actually was listening or being able to hear them. So uh, now you, you get probably my meaning. So the barkings are very different between the pole and the white runner. Um, it, it just, there's a big difference, right? It's very straightforward. And now in the next video, you will see the dachshund that we uh, watch in the alone time assessment with the different components uh, that separation side dogs have in common.
I hope now it makes more sense. <laughs> it probably does. Makes a lot more sense. Thank you for that. <laughs> I'm glad you told me. Otherwise, I would have just finished this without knowing that nobody was able to hear anything. The other videos uh, didn't even have much of uh, sound. The only one that had a little bit of sound was the one uh, with the dog adapting to a new home, but it was just a tiny little bit of a whining. So I don't think it's worth watching again, but just, just take my word for it. <laughs> um, Okay, let's come back to this and let's watch. So now again, I ask you the same question. It's different if our dog is harming himself or he's just whining. Is it less important to address a case that looks mild in our eyes compared with a case that looks more severe because the intensity of the signs looks bigger or, uh, or uh, harder to watch from us, from our perspective? The truth is that we can't really know how the dog is feeling. Because again, the signs are just an expression of that underlying fear and anxiety that the dog is experiencing. And everybody can react to things differently, which doesn't mean that one person, or in this case, a dog, is suffering more than the other one. Therefore, all cases are an emergency and are important to be addressed right away. And they're all addressed in the same way, no matter the severity of the case. So even though if a dog is hurting himself, it could be an emergency more than the other one just because you wanna keep him safe and because there's risks in the environment and for the dog, it doesn't mean that the other cases shouldn't be addressed right away either. The other thing we have to consider when we implement a training plan is that do we really need to know the cause? There's so much information out there about separation anxiety. Some of this information isn't up to date and some information are actually myths. And one of them, the typical one that a lot of my clients come to me with is feeling guilty because their dogs sleep with them, because they pay a lot of attention to their dogs, because they give their dogs a lot of things for free. And they are struggling with reconciling that maybe they will have to stop doing all of these things, that they should not pay attention to their dogs, that they should ignore them, that they should put them to sleep somewhere else. And all of this list of things that they have read online. And because they think that they cause separation anxiety due to doing all of those things. And the truth is that we don't really know what causes separation anxiety. 
We do think that there is a, pre a genetic predisposition that combined with the right environmental factors triggers the onset of this disorder. And those environmental factors are usually in the line of change or something that could be traumatizing for the dog. But it might be that we will never really know or be able to find out what happened in the life of that dog that triggered this. It could be that it was triggered much earlier before we adopted that dog. It could be that the dog always suffered from this, or it could be that we actually are able to point out and see that uh, the dog was living with us and something happened and then there was this onset of this disorder. But even though either if we know or if we don't, it won't really change how we're gonna be implementing the training protocol. So there's no need to dwell about not knowing or not being sure about this. And also there's no need of going through all the, we will try to disattach from our dogs and we'll try to don't give anything for free and don't pay attention to our dogs to be able to solve this disorder. And I'm gonna talk about that in a moment. So before we move into the couple of aspects uh, or important aspects of the training program, the last question to implement this is that could we have prevented it? So again, if I hadn't slept with my dog and, since I adopted him and I hadn't treated my dog as a baby, maybe this wouldn't be happening. The truth is, again, that since we don't know the cause, we can't really prevent it. When we don't know the cause of something, we can't prevent that something. And so even though we can do a lot of things to try to minimize the chances of this to be expressed, the onset of separation anxiety, there's no guarantees that we are not going to encounter it at some point in the life of that dog. And that is why, again, we shouldn't dwell about what did we do wrong. We should instead just focus on what we have ahead and how we can help our dog thrive and overcome this disorder. And the best way of doing this is keeping it simple. And that's where it comes all the list of things that I was mentioning before. So we used to, in the past, to give it this huge list of things that we could try to see if it would help our dog overcome this disorder. And kind of in the way of, I will just throw the spaghetti to the wall and see which one sticks. Uh, and the truth is that it isn't very sustainable over time and very efficient. Why? Because if I have a lot of things that I have to do every day, the likelihood is that I'm not gonna do them all. I mean, I wouldn't. If I have to do a list of 10 things, I will do two or three and I will just grow bored and unmotivated and I will end up not doing anything. It's overwhelming for us and for the dog. And also because many of those things don't actually work, don't make a difference. And within that list of things that don't make really a difference are all the, I want, pet my dog anymore. I won't give uh, my dog anything for free. I won't sleep with my dog anymore. I will try to teach my dog to be in another room while I'm, this, I'm in this room. What happens with those, those situations and with those um, advices or different things that I can implement is that one, if our dog is very used to sleeping with us and just getting things for free and having our attention, if we from one day to another change that, it is likely that that will actually increase the anxiety of the dog because he doesn't know what to expect anymore and why this is happening. And that won't be beneficial for the training because what we want is our dog to be more relaxed. I am not including any other reasons why you would be, you would be thinking on doing all of those things. So if there's anything else going on that it's, it's, it, it makes it a, a needed requirement, such as not sleeping with your dog, if your dog has any aggression issues, things like that, of course, then it's okay for you to put all of those things in practice. But I am just speaking from a separation anxiety perspective. And working on having a dog in another room while I'm in another room or having a baby gate in between to work on the independency of the dog is proven that it actually doesn't transfer to this specific setup of learning to be alone in the house. So yeah, I could try it. Maybe it won't harm the situation, but it is needed. And my bandwidth will actually be able to cover that plus the training I have to do every day. And so it is important to maybe choose our battles and learn to do one thing, but do it so good 
that you can keep doing it for as long as you need to, because this can be a very simple training, but it's not easy and it will take a while. You should set up your expectations in months and not weeks. It is doable though. And what do we do? How do we do it? I love to call uh, to talk about the pillars of separation anxiety. And those are mainly three, but I have four pictures here because the first one is actually seeking help from someone who knows about separation anxiety. Separation anxiety, as I was mentioning before, it's a complex behavior disorder. And there is a lot of information out there and not necessarily all of that, all of that, all of that information is up to date. Uh, and not all of that information is true. So it is very important and it can make a big difference to seek help from a professional who either specializes in separation anxiety or really enjoys working with separation anxiety cases and has learned and has taken a lot of cases and has gained experience in that specific part of things. And then the three main pillars. The first pillar is the medication part of things. And this, even though it's not a must, many dogs do benefit from having a medication protocol in place while going through the training program. And uh, the type of medications we're not going to go in, in, into depth in, 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 in this part of things, but the medications that you're thinking of when you're working on a separation anxiety case are usually in the line of daily medications that will help the dog low, uh, excuse me, increase his threshold and process the information better so he can learn and be more stable. You are not seeking for sedation because you're, and this is a little bit of like, a, uh, I'm going ahead. You're not gonna be exposing your dog to being left alone anymore. So you're not gonna be exposing your dog to go over threshold. And since you're not doing that, you don't really need to sedate your dog. You just need your dog to be happier and more stable and more open to learn. And for that purpose, there's some kinds of medication that work better. There is many different options out there and the, the right option will depend on the dog. And of course, there is also medication combinations between daily medications and situational medication. And in many cases, I use both in conjunction for each particular case. One, uh, although it is important if you're working with a trainer, it's very important to work as a team with your vet as well or to seek help from a vet behaviorist so they can um, cover that part of things. But just so you have a basic idea of when to maybe start thinking about medication, one is if your dog suffers from more behavior issues or struggles than just separation anxiety. If your dog has noise sensitivity, separation anxiety, generalized anxiety, then you're thinking about perhaps a dog who is actually suffering, suffering from a cubicle imbalance. And because all of those disorders are actually, we think that they have a genetic predisposition and they're highly correlated. And so if the dog is suffering from many of them, it, it is very likely that he will benefit from something that stabilizes him. And another reason to think about medication is if the progress is inconsistent. If you're working with your dog and you have been working with your dog for a while and you can't really put a finger on why your dog sometimes does well and sometimes doesn't. And for that purpose, we do keep track of every single detail so we can actually make the connections. So in many cases, it's just tweaking the setup here and there in the environment so we can be successful. But if you really can't make a connection and there's nothing going on in the environment and then that day for that dog, and sometimes your dog does well and sometimes your dog doesn't, or you don't make progress at all. The progress is slow, believe me, but if you don't make any of it, no progress, then those are reasons to think about medication as an aid, as support, so you can continue progressing in your protocol. The second pillar of the separation anxiety training is managing absences. And that means suspension of absence. It means that your dog shouldn't be left alone without a human while you're working on the program. And the only times that your dog is gonna be left alone is while you're doing your training. And that is supervised and it's gonna be below the dog's threshold. So adoration that your dog is able to handle without showing any overt signs of distress. 
And this could sound crazy. It could be like you're just now thinking, well, this is impossible. I work, I have to go out. This is, this is not doable. But the truth is that most operational side dogs are already, when they get to me, they're already not being left alone, if not completely, maybe in a 90% of the time. Because it is dangerous for them because the guardians don't want to see them going through the situation. And sometimes because there's risks of being kicked out of their houses or of the dog harming himself. And so usually completing that 10% left it's not really hard. And also there's many, many, many creative ideas to accomplish this. There are blogs out there, there are different. And if you have any questions, just you know, shoot me an email. I'll be happy to provide different resources and ideas so you can actually cover this part of things. But the why is so important. It is important because you can't teach someone to be okay with something if at the same time you're exposing that person or dog to his worst fear at a level that they can't handle. So if I am trying to work on my fear of moths and I'm going to a therapist and they're showing me moths from very far away and maybe in cartoons and drawings and slowly working their way and increasing the intensity and I'm doing great. But every month I have to go on a trip to Costa Rica to the rainforest and I have to sleep in the cabin in the middle of the rainforest and take 10 moths out of my room before I fall asleep. The likelihood is that I'm not going to overcome my fear ever because I'm exposed to it at a level that I can't handle. And that reminds me that I can't trust in the process because I never know when this situation is going to mean danger. And so we need to teach the dog that there's no danger, that they can trust in us, that everything is safe. And that's the only way we will be able to progressively increase the duration in a safe way. And finally, the training in itself. And the training, I could be speaking for three days. I'm already probably past the time because I always go over. Excuse me, apologize. <laughs> I apologize about that. Um, but it is a very, very long um, explanation. So we're just gonna watch a video instead so you have a basic idea of what the training looks like. But basically it's a, it's a desensitization protocol, which means that we do work on slow increments and approximations to being left alone for longer and longer. This is through training sessions that have many steps with approximations to the door at a different level or intensity. Some of them are just jiggling the door handles. Some of them are going out and coming back in. And slowly we work our way at a level that the dog can handle so we can eventually leave with everything. And not only that, we can stay outside for a long period of time for the amount of time that you have set in your goals. And so here is a little video that will take you through the basics of the desensitization protocol.
I hope that that gives you a better understanding of what a training program looks like. Uh, in that case, that was my dog. She doesn't suffer from separation anxiety and she was really not understanding what was going on, if we were gonna go for a walk or not. So she was following me quite a bit, which can happen at the beginning of the training program with a dog who you, haven't, you haven't worked with because they are unsure of what's happening. They don't know if you're actually gonna leave them alone. They don't know what this is. But once they start falling into the protocol and into this repetition that happens day by day, they start realizing that this is just the time where I take a nap and my mom or dad just do this crazy thing. It go back and forth and it doesn't make any sense. And it's just safe because they never leave for longer than I can handle. And usually it becomes sort of a lullaby. And that's, I love to, 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 to give that analogy. I, it becomes like a little lullaby that lullaby them to sleep. And they tend to relax during these training sessions or missions as we like to call them. Now, before we finish, I just wanted to make a point um, talking about typical questions such as why don't we use maybe food toys or why don't we teach our dog to go to a mat and a stationary position so we can leave and we can implement this training protocol. Well. The first one is the reason why we don't use food toys is mainly two, two, one, well, or three. One of them is because in order for us to make a positive association between something the dog doesn't like and the dog likes, it needs to be in the right order, which means that what should happen is that I leave and then the dog gets the food toy. Otherwise, if it's in the wrong order, which usually tends to happen because we give the toy and then we leave, what happens is that the dog, the toy becomes the predictor of us leaving. And since leaving is aversive for that dog, the toy becomes a predictor of something really bad that's about to happen. And so it isn't really what we wanna do, right? The second reason is that many dogs with separation anxiety actually don't eat. And the ones who eat, is just a distraction. They eat and some of them actually cry while they're eating or they eat and then when they finish the food, they start crying, which actually makes our observation a little bit trickier because we can't really see where the threshold of the dog is because if the toy wasn't there, the threshold would probably would be much earlier and the dog would start reacting much earlier, but we don't know that. And that affects how we implement our training. So we usually don't use toys. The other reason is that the toy and the food usually tends to wake up the dog and make the dog much more active. And once the dog finishes that food, he has a harder time. It's much more challenging for that dog to be able to cope with the situation and relax because remember again, these dogs have a hard time using those coping mechanisms. And that's pretty similar to why we don't use stationary behaviors either. The first reason, which is similar to what I just mentioned, is that operant conditioning, although it's great for many, 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 many different behaviors and many different situations, and we love it, when we're training our dog and we're teaching our dog to do something or asking our dog to do something, what's happening is that that is really motivating and that has, uh, has our dogs pretty much awakening, right? And ready to work and uh, paying attention to us. And that state of mind, is hard to handle once they find themselves alone. It's much easier to have a dog who's relaxed and already in nap mode, being left alone and being able to cope with the situation as compared with a dog that is super active. That's one reason. The other reason is because it is not really feasible for a dog to be one hour in a stationary behavior. At some point, even though I leave the dog in that position, as the durations get longer, at some point the dog will move and that will actually affect our training of mud training if we're doing that training. And it, it won't really, you know, uh, uh, make uh, allow us to reach our goals. And finally is because maybe at first one minute is not super um, hard to stay in, in, in this stationary behavior and paying with one treat is valuable enough for that dog. But at some point, as the durations get longer, one little treat is not gonna be really a, a good pair with staying in that behavior for such a long time. So it gets, the cost gets higher and higher. And so we don't really use that either. And we allow the dog to choose wherever he wants to be. Allowing and providing the dog choice usually tends to help a lot 
with the dog really learning how to deal with the situation. And finally, before we open for questions, the main and big question, the biggest question of all is, does this work? Let's see. I don't know if you remember, but that was the same document that we saw at the beginning uh, when we were talking about the things that separation anxiety does have in common. So you can see that after three weeks, she looks very, very different than what she looked like at the beginning of our work together. I hope you enjoyed this. I hope this was informative. Um, that's my contact information. If you have any questions, need any help, please, shoot me a message, I'll be happy to help you guys. There are a lot of resources in uh, some of my social media if you wanna learn more about this behavior disorder. Thank you. Awesome, thank you so much, Mara. That's a, a lot of information. Um, some great new things, I'm sure, for the dog guardians out there, but also for some of us pros that are used to taking behavior cases, but some new ways of, of looking at some of this. I do have some questions for you. So someone asked, um, any ideas for dogs with confinement issues who are juvenile and kind of risky to be left free, like they teeth on the furniture? Yes, and that's a great question. The truth is, since you are suspending absences and you are going through this protocol observing at all times, so in order to do this protocol and to see what the progress looked like, you have to monitor your dog. So when you embark in a training protocol, you actually use one of the camera options that I mentioned before, and you watch the whole time while you're outside. And this outside time, it sometimes, it starts with maybe three seconds, four seconds, five seconds, and it spreads from there. And so what happens is that it, it, there's like a win-win situation here because you start actually teaching the dog to relax while alone for five seconds and you're observing so there's no risks and as this time lengthens what happens is that the juvenile dog learns to actually relax and sleep while alone and you have a very reliable dog that you know is not going to do anything so we usually tend to opt for having the dog free in the house and observing the dog at all times and the rest of the time the dog is without going through absences so it's pretty easy you can of course close certain areas you know you can have some baby gates some places covered if you are not sure if there are places that are a little bit dangerous that's totally doable as well and of course also trying to set your dog up for success that's the main thing i do with puppies because puppies represent an extra challenge in that sense sometimes you have puppies that are in a puppy mode during a session and it's a disaster and then they are in sleepy nap mode and it's perfect and so trying to find what are the best times of the day to do your training and what amount of exercise your dog needs to actually succeed in training can be very helpful and over time then you won't have to really be so cautious about it because your dog will learn to just relax while alone uh, one more thing i wanted to mention before uh, uh, excuse me there are some cases, though, that you need to confine dogs while you do your training. And there are some cases I'm working. It's very, very rare. I mostly I think I have worked with one or two dogs in my life who we work on in a crate while alone during the training protocol. But some reasons could be if your dog is reactive and it's, it's a safe uh, issue situation. I have one uh, case like that right now, and we opt for confinement just because it could be dangerous if someone opens the door and the dog is free. Uh, and then you will have to, of course, split your criteria more finely if that's the case. But in general, it's not really super needed. Awesome. 
Uh, someone asked how accurate the monitoring devices like whistle are that measure heart rate and things like that, whether those are a useful tool. That's a great question. I actually haven't used them in, in these situations, uh, but I think that could be actually a great way to monitor and add to your data tracking sheet. So you can have even more data of what's happening and how you are uh, implementing your training and what adjustments you do, you should do, you should have, or you should implement. So yeah, that's, that's a great idea. Okay, someone else said that they did some work with a CSAT, but then when they moved, they saw some regressions, but they have to move frequently with their spouse's job. So any tips for people that have to move frequently or be in new environments frequently? that's that's a that's a hard situation that's a hard one uh what i would totally recommend is medication so if you don't have medication in place medication would be a great tool because it will give you some cushion and some support for your dog to be able to tolerate those changes separation anxiety dogs as a norm don't tend to do very well with change and so every change will likely lead to a regression or a plateau. And you, even if it doesn't, you will have to come back to a certain baseline and go like backwards and lower your criteria every time you move. So medication will really, really, really uh, do the trick. The other thing that I would uh, recommend is to try to have a certain routine that transfers to each of the places you move. Uh, whether that is the way that you implement your training sessions, what you have around the house, if you have a white noise machine, let's say every time you do your training, something that provides um, some sort of anchor and that is predictable for the dog. So the dog, no matter where he is, he knows this is our house and this is what we do and we do it every day. And it's just kind of like brushing our teeth or eating our meal or going for potty. And, and that should give the dog a little bit of sense of, of safety and maybe be able to handle each of those uh, changes a little bit better. But that's a hard one, definitely. Great. So are there certain pre-departure cues that you often see pet parents forget to include in their list? At first, that's a funny, uh, funny uh, you ask a question because it happens to me sometimes that uh, when I ask for the PDQs to get started, um, it's like, okay, yeah, shoes and purse and whatever else I need to take. And there's like not a lot of recognition at first uh, of, of what are PDQs, right? But as we move forward into the training, it's so cool to see the guardians just realizing every single detail of what they do and just organize so well about everything. I, I think if you have a good coach and good guidance, it's not really likely that you are going to forget anything because if you're working with someone who is watching every of your movements in a very obsessive way, you will be able to really tell if there is something missing. Um, Funny enough, though, I had this, it had actually never happened to me. And not long ago, I, I, I was talking to a client and she was describing something she had done out when she was exiting the building door. And she points out, and then when the screen door shut, this happened. And I was like, what screen door? <laughs> oh my God, you have a screen door? <laughs> and it had, it just, I don't know why I it slipped uh, and I didn't notice that they had a screen door. So we had to really talk about that. And that could be may, maybe one of the things that people tend to forget. So not assuming that a door, because it's a door, it's fine if it's two. So one door, two doors, a lock. Do I unlock the door every time that I open it? Do I, un do I lock it when I'm inside the house, unlock and lock on every step? Those kind of little things could be maybe subtleties that people tend to forget or assume as normal. That would be important to keep in mind. Okay, and we have one other question. I, I think I understand the question. It was about the confinement, confinement anxiety between the baby gate or a crate versus the front door isn't it all still a barrier since the front door is, is confining the dog, but how do we, how do we kind of separate those things? Although I don't have data, like data evidence enough to tell you that this is for sure significant. Um, I have found in my experience that if the dog has access to your, the door you leave from, 
like physical access to get there, they tend to feel a little bit more in control and relaxed than if you have a baby get, let's say, in the hallway and they can see the door from afar, but they can't reach it. That's just something that I have seen in my experience. Um, but uh, and, and, and then the baby gate, it, even though they have access to a main area, the baby gate can definitely be a reason to react. I have this uh, experience. I always tell this story because it's, it's kind of funny, but it's also pretty enlightening that I uh, work with this Malinois from Working Lines and he was, he suffered from confinement issues and they thought that he also had separation anxiety. He of course had a lot of energy. And what was happening was that he was destroying the house. And they, there was a baby gate in the threshold between the kitchen and the living room. And he was totally able to jump this, this baby gate like nothing. And so during an assessment, actually we saw him jumping, going to the kitchen, grabbing the garbage can, bringing the garbage can, jumping back and going to eat the trash in the living room. So it wasn't a barrier at all. However, when the baby gate was open, he wouldn't react at the same intensity and he would be able to relax, which it was pretty pretty crazy to see that difference in, in his behavior and realize that just having that open would solve our, our problem. So that gives you an idea of the perspective of the dog and how different it is compared to what we might think that is having a lot of room in the house or not. That's an amazing story. Dogs are dogs are so interesting. It's the things that, I mean, humans do it too, that we pick up on that you wouldn't realize. Awesome. Yep. Thank and you another such thing, oh. uh, excuse me. And another thing that in that, and this is just a curiosity in case you guys are interested, but that particular dog, and it has happened more than once to me, really like to lay down on the dining room table. <laughs> and it was a point, there was a point where the, the guardian told me, you know what, I don't care. As long as my dog is not destroying my house and he's having fun and he's relaxed while I'm a, while he's alone, I will just buy a bed and put it on top of the dining room table. And so that's what we did. Uh, but I have noticed that dogs with confinement issues really enjoy being perched and being like higher up and that they find higher places. I don't know why my reasoning is because maybe they feel that they have more control over the situation, but I am completely rumbling and just, you know, thinking out loud, but it has happened to me more than once. So I think it's just an interesting point to make. <laughs> such, a, such a funny thing. The things you learn while you're training. That's awesome. Well, thank you so much, Moira. We really appreciate it. That was a lot of good questions. Folks, if you have other questions, um, Moira's contact information is on here. So please do reach out. Um, if you are looking for help with separation anxiety, please reach out, um, have somebody work with you. As Moira said, it's one of the most important factors in treating separation anxiety. Um, thank you so much for coming out today. If you liked what you heard, reach out to Moira. You can follow her on Facebook and Instagram. We're also out there. If you liked what you saw, please check out some of our upcoming webinars. I will shoot out the link for this one tomorrow, as long as YouTube lets me post it okay. If you'd like to make a donation or buy a t-shirt, we would love that. But otherwise, please let folks know that we're having these webinars. Um, we have a couple of really cool ones coming up. There's a cooperative care one in a few weeks, one about control unleashed for reactive dogs. There's another one on walking and how to manage your walk so that every dog gets what they need from it. So lots of really cool content coming up. Stay tuned um, and we'll see you next time. And thank you so much, Mara, for being here all the way from Brazil. <laughs> thank you for having me. <laughs> all right. Have a good night, everyone. Bye. Bye.